Vera at the Ballroom Prologue The corridors of Welwick Hall, on the Bodmin Estate, were long and winding, as well as cold and damp for some of the lesser unused ones. If one didn't know where one was going, one might happen to lose oneself. But the three children sneaking along its passageways knew exactly where they were heading, the library. Oscar led the way and had insisted that Vera stay in the middle, between the boys, as they tread with great care not to be heard. It meant that Vera's twin brother, Silas, was at the rear. She had to admit that she liked Oscar's idea of putting her in the middle, in between two people who she loved most dearly. All three children were ten years old, all born in the same year, all born at Wellwick Hall. But the twins were born in a small room in the large attic. This was where the residency of the servants was situated, of which there were many for such a large manor house. For Oscar, Vera knew that he had been born in a huge four-poster bed, because he had shown them it several times. Nothing excited the children more than evading the adults who scolded the twins for daring to play with his grace's son. Vera was well aware of what Oscar's father, the Duke of Cornwall, thought of his son playing with the servants' children. Yet this never stopped Oscar from seeking them out. He was like another brother to her, and she'd feel sad if they didn't play together. In fact, Oscar was the one who came up with places for them to meet up because he usually knew the whereabouts of his father. They did everything they could to remain undetected. Not that Oscar's mother minded, all she wanted was for her son to be happy. As they arrived at the huge double doors that opened up into the enormous library, Silas called out from the back. It's a bit of a risk considering your father's home Oscar, he said in a low voice as the children huddled together in the hallway. He'd never think to find us here, Oscar said, determined to get into the library, for he knew that it was Vera's favourite room. He has no idea that I have taught you both to read and write, he thinks you ignorant, remember? Yes, but if we are caught, it will be Vera and me that will get the punishment dished out, Silas reminded him. The last time he locked us in our room for a whole day. Stop being so soft, Vera said, poking her brother's arm with her finger, teasingly. Ouch! Stop doing that, Silas growled. Vera knew that he wouldn't poke her back because he never did anything to hurt her. Considering he was a boy, she was far tougher than him, and always happy to take risks, if it meant having fun with Oscar. Then stop acting like a baby, she teased again. I want to see the books, I love books and well you know it. Oscar opened one of the doors, and turned to Silas, I promise if we are caught, I will make sure that father does not punish you harshly. Silas mumbled to himself, still carrying a look of worry on his face, but Vera pushed him through the door. When it came to books, she would risk anything because a good book was always worth the risk. Oscar was the first to grab a book from a shelf at random because that was how they played their game. Whatever book was chosen at random was the book they would read together. Silas and Vera went to hide underneath one of three long tables set up in the library. It was where they always hid when they managed to sneak into the library. When Oscar joined them under the table, Vera was the first to speak, what book is it? She asked, keen to know if it was going to be a good one. Not that there was a book in the world that she wouldn't enjoy. It's called Twelfth Night, by William Shakespeare, Oscar read the title as he tilted the book. Ah, it's a play. I love Shakespeare, Vera said wondering if Oscar knew that the shelf held all the Shakespeare books and so had chosen it on purpose. Let's get started, and stop fidgeting Silas, I want to listen to Oscar reading. Silas moved around, peeking out from under the table to check the door. I know this story, we have read it before, Vera shared. It is about a woman who dresses up as a man. The odd thing is that another woman falls in love with her. Even Silas giggled at that because it was such a funny story, all three children were tickled by the concept. Oscar began. Oh, when mine eyes did see Olivia first, 
methought she purged the air of pestilence. That instant was I turned into a heart, wait, wait. Vera interrupted him by taking hold of the arm that held the book. As it's a play, we can all read different parts. But I must be Viola, and Silas can play my brother, Sebastian. I don't want to read out loud, we will be heard, Silas snapped, for he could not stop his worrying. Our mother will be in trouble too, and she can't afford for the Duke to send us all away. Vera turned to her brother, don't be silly, who will cook for the Duke if they send mother away? If Silas is so worried then we should leave, Oscar suggested, looking at her brother. He could see from his expression that poor Silas was fretting. Then you all get to miss playing Duke Orsino's part, and you know that's a great part to play, Vera said, attempting to entice Oscar onto her side of thinking. That means I get to marry you, Oscar said with a big, cheeky grin. Vera nodded with the excitement that she had at least won Oscar over, now she needed to work on her brother. I tell you what, let's skip to scene four where Viola is disguised as a man and the Duke believes her masquerade. I suppose it will cut our time in the library short, Silas nodded as he agreed. Now then, don't be laughing at me because I'm going to read with a deep voice, and that's because I'm pretending to be a man, she said, looking at the two boys with a perfectly serious glare. I'll do my best to woo your lady. Without warning, the library door burst open. Come out from under there, all three of you. The Duke's voice boomed. They looked at one another with growing dread, Silas seemed the worst, with a terrible fear etched on his face. Don't worry so, Oscar assured him, and he made to climb from under the table first. The twins followed close behind him. How dare you Oscar? His father said to his son, throwing his arms up in the air. I do not want you associating yourself with the children of the servants. Now go to your room until dinner is served. The Duke turned to the twins, you two do not belong in this part of the house. Ah, Barker, there you are, he said as he looked over at the house butler. Vera watched as the stuffy butler came toward them. She turned her face to her brother, rolling her eyes at the butler's presence. His face was red with fury but that didn't frighten her, not one bit. Barker, return these children to the kitchen. Ask their mother to find them some work to keep them occupied, the Duke ordered, turned, and marched away. Both children knew what was coming next. Barker grabbed hold of their ears and twisted them in his fingers. Silas yelped but Vera made no sound at all. She would never let the butler know that he had hurt her, it would give him too much pleasure. He then let go of their ears and grabbed each child of their arms, dragging them as his fingers dug into their skin. I ought to give the pair of you a good hiding, he told them in a stern voice. You never do as you're told. You're a pair of scoundrels, that's what you are. Wait until I see your mother. Somehow, he managed to keep his firm grip on their arms all the way through the large house, and down into the kitchens. There, he threw them to the cold floor, right in front of their shocked mother. I do not take kindly to finding your offspring on the loose about the house, he called out. Give them some work of the hardest kind, immediately, or you will all find yourselves homeless. As he was leaving, Silas scowled at him, his anger finally stirring. How dare he talk to you in that way mother? He's only a servant of the house too. Silence. I'll be having no cheek from the likes of you too. Now get out to the well and fetch me six buckets of water. I need to get it on the boil, she instructed them. But the buckets are too heavy for Vera, Silas complained. Nonsense, it serves her right, his mother said, pursing her lips. If I know my daughter, she's likely the one who got you into trouble in the first place. With miserable looking faces, the twins turned to leave through the back door, heading for the well. Fetching water was usually a job for one of the bigger boys. You can fill the buckets in the well, and I'll carry them back to the kitchen, 
Silas suggested to his sister, so that she didn't have to carry them. I might be a girl, but I can manage the buckets just as well as you can, she scolded. Oh dear, I. I'm sorry Silas, I didn't mean to shout. But I can carry my share and mother was right, it was my fault. In the future, I'm going to listen to you more often. In the future, I'll be big and strong, and I'll protect you better from the likes of Barker, Silas promised her. Nah. He's harmless enough. He can be kind to us when he wants to be. Remember at Christmas, when he always gets a gift for us. She grinned. But he's the head of the household so he has to tell us off. If you ask me, I do believe that he likes us really. With that proclamation, the twins got on with their task, between them they made a vow never to get caught again. Thank you for watching. The next chapter and more audiobooks are coming extremely soon. Until then, watch one of the following videos. Please press the like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. It helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Follow us on social media and visit our eShop at www.starfallpublicationsbooks.com to receive hot offers. Save 10% on your first order using YouTube 10 code at checkout.